Well, church, grab your copies of God's Word and turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 6. We'll start reading verse 10 together. We'll read for a few verses and then we'll turn over and finish with chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Ecclesiastes 6, verse 10. And when you find it, would you stand with me out of reverence to God's perfect, holy, and inspired word? Whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what is man, and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity, and what is the advantage to man? For who knows what is good for man while he lives, the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? And then chapter 7, verse 13 Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other. So that man may not find out anything that will be after him. Let's pray together. Father, you have already given us of your son, And you have given us of your word, and you have given us of your spirit. Father, we ask that the unison of the gospel hope, the power of our salvation would be with us this morning as we try to to dive into this beautiful yet difficult text. Father, would you be our guide and our convictor and our comforter this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, church. Please be seated. We have a deep appreciation for the first responders. Some of us have watched some video footage from this last week as two police officers ran into fire in order to stop evildoers from doing evil things. Whether that's the fire department or the battlefield, we appreciate those who are willing to go to the hard places and do the hard things in order to bring justice into the world. In a spiritual way, friends, we are called to do the same kind of thing. And that is what the professor Koheleth is doing for us. Not the field of of battle on, on the soldiers, but the field of battle for souls. We don't run away from hard issues or problem people. By the way, we're all problem people. If you did not know that about yourself... Now you do. We walk towards them calmly with our wits about us because we know that we're not alone. God has not left this battle up to ourselves. We go with the spirit and with the word. And we have truth and knowledge and wisdom laid before us. And so, friends, we are the first responders. First, of course, to our own soul, guiding it pulling back from the brink that we are so inclined to fall over, and then doing so for for one another as we live out the law of Christ, as we are our brother's keeper, our sister's keeper. And that's why this section of Ecclesiastes is is so beautiful and so difficult as well. This is probably the most notoriously difficult section of Ecclesiastes, one of the most difficult books of the entire Bible. And from what I've seen, the weaker a person's view of God is, the weaker will be their ability to interpret and apply these verses beautifully. Because here's what the professor does. He takes the world as we expect it to be, and he just flips it upside down, right on its head. And it's it's disorienting. We get kind of seasick. We're like, wait, what is truth here? And where's the horizon? I don't know where I'm going. But the Word is our guide, and the Spirit is with us. And we are going to make sense of this beautiful passage this morning. And this beautifully hits on some of the core heart issues not just for unbelievers out there, people who do not know the Lord, whose hope is not in Christ, that is true, but friends, we are in here as well. Our hearts are all over these verses of Ecclesiastes. The professor begins and ends this section not with us, but with God. And I love how he does this. The, the original, original Hebrew text makes this way, way more clear than we're able to see with our English translations. 
the, the words and expressions we see in chapter 6, verses 10 through 12, and 7, 12 through 14, are all linked together. Perfect symmetry, harmony coming together. So in the original Hebrew, it would have been clear that this is one section, this is one thought the, in our Bibles is broken up over two, over two chapters. As I said, the, the chapter and verse headings are a helpful tool, but sometimes are inadequate, conveying the argument. So this is, this is one section that the professor is trying to give us. And God is sovereign over all of it. This is a beautiful portion of God's word because it puts us in our place. The teacher does not speak ill of us, doesn't run us down into the dirt and push our nose into the muck. But he is reminding us that we are to dust and to dust we will return. That God knows that we are dust. And so he wants us to have wisdom and joy and true happiness in the havel that is life under the sun. Not the fake stuff that the world gives us that our, our flesh longs for. But the real stuff is found here in the wisdom of the Lord. He wants us to have wisdom to glean good things for our souls, but sometimes that requires first responders, requires us to go hard places and speak hard truth to our own hearts. Lest we think this is some novel Old Testament treatment of wisdom, I want to remind you guys what Paul says to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says this, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparisons. As we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. The Apostle Peter says this, Rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings that you also may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. As David says in Psalms 90, so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. We're going to be numbering our days together this morning. So look with me, chapter 6, verse 10. The professor says, whatever has come has already been named and it is known what man is, and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity. And what is the advantage to man? For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain, vaporous life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? In case you're wondering, the answer is yes. God is stronger than us. God has already named all that has and all that will come to pass. Now, this is not an expression that we use today, but we know what it looks like. To name something is a, is a sign, a symbol of our authority and responsibility over it. Parents name their children. Children name their pets. And God names everything. All that has come to pass, all that will come to pass, Every atom of every star, in every aspect, in every corner of the universe, God has already named it. In all t time and in all space. His will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is a prayer we pray because we know it is going to be true. And this is the first step of what we call Christian theism. We do not accuse God of being culpable of evil, nor responsible for evil, but he uses it for his ends and for his purposes, culminating in the cross event itself. And so we do not dispute with him, though we try sometimes. And while our tendency is to doubt and to distrust the heart of God, we speak truth. We are the first responders on the scene of our own hearts, speaking the truth of the gospel but we try. Look at verse 11. The professor knows us, right? He knows us better than we know ourselves. He says, the more words, the more vanity. And what is the advantage to man? You can walk into any library or any bookstore, digital or physical, and you will see an ocean of books, a sea of words all put together. And in one way or another, every one of them is disputing with God. 
Most books that have ever been written are written with a heart denying God's sovereignty over everything, trying to argue there's another way, there's a different way, there's a better way in science or technology and relationships. But as chapter 1 of Romans makes clear, that is an impossible task. It is the fool's errand, but friends, our libraries are full of fool's errands. So the professor is putting in our, us in our place because God is putting us in our place. This is not like a dad screaming at a child to sit down because we're driving over a road. This is a father gently buckling us in for the, the bumpy road ahead. We are limited. Our sight is limited. Our time is limited. So look at verse 12. For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life which he passes like a shadow. For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? Friends, the reality is we don't know and we can't see. It is beyond us. The moment that our eyes close for the last time, we have absolutely no idea what's going to happen for the rest of the universe, for the rest of the days. There are moments where the wisest men of earth seek to grasp some light of truth in creation. And by God's grace, they can do it. You can look at great philosophers from Plato to to Peterson, and there are moments that they step into the divine world. They speak truths based on God's God's grace of of natural law and, and the rule of our own hearts and the revelation of the universe. There is truth to be eked out of the universe But man ultimately cannot take credit for it. It comes from God and it is a gift from God. And so what what do we do? What do we do? We listen. God is speaking first through his word and through the full revelation of his son. Logos, the word made flesh. All other ground is sinking sand. And friends, we need the truth. It seems to me that the world is growing darker and colder And bolder, Christians are now being martyred, not on foreign shores, but on our own. Evelyn, Haley, William, Cynthia, Catherine, and Mike have tasted the bitter fruit of the wisdom of man. This week as martyrs in Nashville, but now they're tasting the sweet fruit of the love of God. There is the wisdom of man, and there is the wisdom of God, and they will always be in opposition. So the professor is going to be showing us how to have wisdom and the good life in the fleeting vapor that is our lives. So first we're going to see three major major proverbs and then six smaller ones to get us through the end. So look at chapter 7, verse 1. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. My guess is many of us this morning put on some deodorant, some aftershave, some perfume, trying to rid ourselves of the stench that is our natural odor. Many of us experienced what it's like to go to youth camp And young men decide that Axe body spray is better than three days of taking showers. And it makes it worse. It makes it so much worse. It's like Lazarus coming out of the grave. (laughs) By now he reeketh. Instead of the odor going before us, we want the perfume to go ahead of us. The professor is saying there's something even better. Something even better than the nicest, most expensive perfume, and that is a good name, a good reputation, the respect and appreciation and and admiration of others. And this is one of the things I love, and I even, I noticed it this morning, thinking about this text, I, I heard it and I saw it with my own eyes, is the precious ointment of love in the body of Christ. You see someone from afar and you smile the warm hug or or handshake. When you see someone and your heart sings just a little bit for joy, that's what this is talking about. And that means church. 
We must be the kind of people that have that for others. Not buying reputation, not trying to glad hand the high rollers. We're saying having this kind of love for one another, that when others see you, their heart responds with a mini song of joy. I, I love that person. That is what a good reputation is. And then the professor makes a crazy statement, the first of many, that just as a good name is better than the fanciest, most expensive perfume, something else is even better. The day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting. Now, the professor is not against feasting. In fact, he recommends it. But he's acknowledging that feasting can only satiate our cravings for a couple of hours. There's something that can satiate our soul for our, our lives. And what is that? That is going to the house of mourning. And why? He tells us why. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. The living will lay it to heart. And I mentioned this before, but we don't do this anymore. We wash and we sanitize our hands from mourning. We went from having funerals where we dressed in black to memorials where we dressed business casual to celebrations of life where we dressed in party clothes. Instead of mourning death for weeks, as we used to do, as was the custom even for believers, now we do it for a few hours. Our culture, friends, does not want to meditate on death. And I think we Christians can take that to heart. and We can live the same kind of belief that life is fleeting and mourning is quick. I think there's foolishness there. It's like, uh, it's like mission trips. We send our youth to, to other countries, to hard, dark places. We do it maybe for the people there, but we all know secretly it's a huge burden to house a bunch of high schoolers in another country for the people who actually live there. The, the benefit is not for the people we're doing ministry with. It's for our kids. When they didn't get their Air Jordans this year, it means very little compared to not having food and water and electricity. It's perspective. Perspective. And, and that is what the house of mourning is. That is what a good, beautiful, Christ-centered, gospel-saturated funeral is. It is for us. It's not for them. They're with the Lord. They're not with us anymore. It is for us. So let me encourage you as a pastor. And we do a great job of this. This is not a rebuke, but let me encourage you. When, when we lay one of our brothers and sisters to rest in the Lord, we have a, a funeral service, be, be a part of those moments in our church body. It is good for your souls. Better than a, a beautiful out with your friend or spouse or husband is coming to a memorial service. It is good for our souls to feast on the fleeting reality of our life. The second major section here is in, in verse 3, and it's connected beautifully to the one that just came before. He says, sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. What does our culture say? What does most cultures say? The good life is found in, in revelry and laughter, right? The good weekend is the one that you don't remember. The bottle and the bar is where joy is to be found. But what does wisdom do? What does the professor say? He flips that upside down. Sorrow is better than laughter. For by sadness of the face, the heart is made glad. We know that we can make ourselves temporarily happy, but then hate ourselves in the morning. And I just want to, to remind us for, for a minute, we're now a few generations into this kind of a social experiment, that the house of Reveille is the place of joy and of freedom. And we're seeing the fruit of that kind of heart for a few generations in America. And there are casualties all around us. As we, as we speak the truth to culture, as we love the world more than it wants to be loved and tell them what they most need to know, friends, we're, we're dealing with broken people who are living out the foolishness the professors have been talking about here. 2,800 years and there's nothing new under the sun. 
We are broken people, ministering to broken people, and we, we love them as such. So what is wisdom? Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the face, the heart is made glad. And again, pro the professor is not against smiling. He's not trying to say, don't be happy and be sad all the time. But he's giving us the real things in life. A good memorial service where we shed a tear and we have a smile on our face, remembering one who has loved the Lord and is now with the Lord, does far more for our soul, far lasting joy in our hearts than going and having a night of revelry. The last major proverb is in verse 5. He says, it is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of fools. This also is vanity. Now we feel this. We can hear this, can't we? The sound of thorns catching fire in a pot, right? firecrackers in a pot, and they, they go off. It is a fun, loud noise, and it goes as quickly as it came. This is the laughter of fools. It is, it is vapor. Again, Koheleth is not against laughter. He wants us to smile. He wants us to have joy, but not the fake stuff of the world. Not laughing over things that should cause us to blush. As Christians, friends, we can laugh in ways that those who do not know the Lord, who do not have the peace of the Lord, ever could. Again, most unbelievers out there and a whole lot of Christians think that God is the cosmic killjoy. He has come to destroy joy and happiness in life. And the opposite is true. He has come to give us joy, joy that overflows despite the circumstances of life. Because our future is bright and our salvation is secure and we are loved and we are known. This is joy and happiness in ways the world cannot possibly understand. So what does the world do? They listen to the songs of fools. It is better to, to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the songs of fools. I am not smart enough, nor brave enough, nor foolish enough to tell you which musical artist you can or cannot listen to. I'm not going to hand out a list of uh, approved song lists and artists after service today. But we should hear the warning of Koheleth. If we wade in the waters of musical foolishness, we have to know we're going to swallow some of it. It's going to ingest into our system. Now, lest you think, great, Pastor Brad is telling us we should listen to Christian music. Oh, buddy. There is a lot of Christian music out there that is probably worse than the stuff you'll hear on the Christian radio station. I had a, a friend of mine who was a worship pastor. He listened to three straight hours of music on the local Christian music station. In those three hours, he never heard the gospel one time, that we are dead in our sins, that Jesus had to die and offer as a gift of forgiveness for those who would repent and believe. Nothing of any semblance of the gospel. A few fleeting one-liners about the idea of there being sin and I needing to repent, most of it was just emotive drivel, songs that could be played on the secular station regarding a man's love for his girl or on the Christian station for a man's love for, for Jesus. A lot of the stuff that's being produced for Christians, friends, isn't even made by Christians. You guys know this. We're a product. They have a line to sell, and because we pay up, they're willing to produce it. So the question I want to leave us with is which is better, Ingesting a little bit of poison that you know is not the best or intentionally ingesting stuff that you, you don't know where is coming from. Let us be cautious. Let us be weary of listening to the song of fools that the professor says is as the crackling of thorns under a pot. What is better? He says this in verse 5, it is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise Friends, that's exactly what the professor is doing to us right now. He is giving us rebukes so we can learn and grow and leave changed. 
Now, here's what's so hard. The one thing you and I do not want to do is hear the rebuke of the wise, right? This is hard for our souls. We want to be affirmed and supported even when we make foolish decisions. And so if you, if you have a friend who you know will call you out when you say or do something stupid, give them a big hug. That is a loving friend. If you have a friend who you know would never choose to call you out in spite of your foolishness, find a better friend. Or even better, be a good friend and, and show them a better way. One of the sad things we've seen in our growingly consumeristic society is there are, are more and more churches that are, are for the fools, that only affirm what people want to hear, never say what, what God says, what the Bible says. It is better, friends, for us to hear the rebuke of the wise. Now we're going to see a series of six Proverbs, all hitting the, the notes of life that we all experience under the sun. And we're going to hear beautiful echoes of Proverbs throughout this section. Look at verse 7. Surely oppression drives the wise into madness, and a bribe corrupts the heart. I do believe we're seeing this more and more. Not that the corruption hasn't always been a part of every society for all time. We talked about that last Sunday. But with the advent of technology and Social media now, the, the bribery and the corruption is, is more easy to find. It's more clearly in front of our eyes, less hidden than it used to be. One of the amazing things is as a society becomes more and more corrupt, corruption abounds even, even more, right? The, the more we indulge in ourselves and say, I don't see that, but I do see that, the worse it does to our hearts. So for we who love the Lord... I want to first encourage you, then I want to warn us all. First, I want to encourage you, the miscarriage of justice and oppression should drive us to madness. This is not a sinful remark. He's not saying, since God is on the throne, don't let the world being broken break you. No, it should. It should break our hearts. Everywhere we see injustice and oppression, and it's everywhere, all of the time, it should affect us. But we do not do unwise things with our madness and our anger. We trust God and we cry out, how long, O Lord? That's not just the, the song of worship and the prayer of the saints in heaven. It's also the song of worship and prayer of the saints on earth. How long, O Lord, until you make everything right? Then he says in verse 8, Better is the end of a thing than its beginning, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. I've been working on some projects around my house this last week, and there's something satisfying in our soul the moment the last screw is in, the, the, the moment the last thing is hung on the wall, and it's a completed deal, right? There's, there's a joy there versus the moment when you open up the instruction manual, and it's pages and pages, and it's upside down, and you don't read Spanish, and it's all in Spanish. <laughs> Better is the end of a thing than its beginning, and friends, that is ultimately true of the Christian life. One day we'll breathe our last and our eyes will close and they'll awaken. That's the good thing. That's the thing we're waiting for and we're longing for. The patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. I love how the, the professor does this beautiful contrast between one and the other. We think of being proud. The opposite is maybe being humble or self-effacing or speaking badly of yourself in front of people, but that's not what it is. The opposite of being proud is being patient. If you find patience hard to come by, the reason why is because you and I are struggling with pride in our heart, demanding what I want, when I want it, and the answer is now. It is better to be patient than to be pride. Another way that pride can evidence itself, he talks about in verse 9. He says, be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. You know, there was a, a few years in my life when I was very, very angry all of the time. Just constantly filled with this weird rage monkey that I couldn't get off my, off my shoulders and God was gracious, and he, he saved me from myself. 
But every once in a while, I would do something really, really dumb, really, really foolish, and it was my anger. It was my quickness to anger. Again, we warn us all, if you find that your anger is a, is a flare, it quickly lights up the night sky, the professor is then calling you a fool. We have to, friends, control that for the glory of God, have to know our weaknesses for the glory of God. But there is also, friends, a righteous anger. Not only we can have, but I would argue we should have. We, we must have. This world is a dark and broken place. This world is the dominion and in dominion of the powers of darkness. That should drive us to anger. But just as God is slow in his anger towards us, we must be slow in letting that righteous anger turn into a quickness of anger with unbelievers who do not know the Lord. And this is one of the fears I have for myself, for, for the Christians in America. Again, as we see the path, we are week by week moving on. It turns to anger and rage in our hearts. And there is a good blessing in that. And we should respond accordingly. But there's a danger as well. That, that our ability to love unbelievers is being muted. That as the culture wars rage on and we're in it, that we see those who we need to reach with the gospel as enemies to barely be defeated. God has called us to walk a different path. Righteous anger, yes, but an anger that points to the, the righteous anger of God poured out upon his son as only hope of salvation. That's the thing we're looking at ultimately. So what should we be doing? The professor turns the page in verse 11. He says, wisdom is good with an inheritance and advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. And the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. So what is wisdom? If it's good, if it's an advantage, if it's protection, where does it begin? Well, the entire book of Proverbs has been written to encourage us with this one major theme, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I think that fear comes at us in two ways. First, in the moments we have before we put our faith in Christ alone, it is a fear of the Lord that says, God is my judge, that I stand fully condemned in my sins, no hope of salvation, no exit sign to lead me away from the destruction that awaits my soul. But that fear drives us to the next fear which is a righteous fear, a loving fear. As we talked about, a kind of fear that draws us in close to feel the warmth and the love of God. He sent his son to die on the cross that we might be adopted as sons and daughters, co-heirs with Christ. This is the fear of the Lord. This is wisdom. Where does it begin? With the fear of the Lord. Where does it end? In the presence of the Lord. And so we consider, look at verse 13 with me, chapter 7. Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other. So that man may not find out anything that will be after him. God is sovereign. And that is true in the days of prosperity when everything is awesome. And that is the true in the days of adversity, when everything is awful. God has made one as well as the other. God sends rain on one and the other, sun on one and the other. God has named our days, and so we trust. We consider the work of God, that he is beyond us, that he is imperfect, meticulous, all-encompassing, sovereign control over everything in the universe. And so we can rest and our hearts can be glad. We can find joy in the fleeting vapor that is our lives under the sun. If you're a follower of Christ this morning, God not only names creation, he has named you. He has given you a new name. The adoption certificate has been signed and sealed with the Holy Spirit himself. And one day God will take us away from the days of trouble. And he will give us only that which is delight on prosperity forevermore. 
But until then, he is going to carry us through. He will carry us through. So let us have wisdom for the here and now. If you're not a follower of Christ this morning, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. First, to fear the Lord as judge, that you will stand and give account, condemned in your sins, and then repent and receive the second kind of fear, a fear that says, I will draw close. My sins have been atoned and paid for by the blood of Christ, and now I am accepted and I am named. Church, whatever has come to be has already been named And it is known what man is that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. And so we trust and rest. Let's pray together. Father, this world is dark. And we as Christians, it feels like uh, somebody is turning off the lights on us one by one. And we feel that in our souls And so, Father, would you rightly allow us to be enraged and in anger at the oppression, oppressions of the poor, oppressions of the weak, the distortion of truth and reality, even from the the youngest in our society? But Father, would you help we who are your sons and daughters to not allow our rightful anger and disgust at the brokenness of the world to callous our hearts or to give in to that as as impatient servants. In every culture you plant us, we are citizens of a country of light, but dwelling in the citizens in the country that is dark. And so, Father, we are called to be that gospel light. We get to be calm, full of joy and satisfaction, knowing that you are on your throne. No occurrence on earth shakes your footstool. And so, Father, would you help us to have the beautiful balance of anger at what is broken, not just in the world, but with ourselves, but joy knowing that you have a plan, that your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And ultimately, you delight in bringing good out of the chaos, bringing satisfaction out of of evil. Ultimately, the cross of Christ, the place where heaven and earth meet, the place where your wrath meets with human depravity, and the achievement was our salvation. And so, Father, would you help us have wisdom today? As we've heard these sayings from Koheleth, these warnings that he is setting out for us, same heart issues from 2,800 years ago is still with us today. There's no changing our natures. And so, Father, may we see, may we hear and learn and grow. And Father, if there's anyone here this morning or watching online who have not yet put their faith in, in the death of your son alone, Father, would that, that veil over their heart be removed? May you bring them from fear of you as judge into fear of you as as Lord and Savior. And may they repent and believe the gospel. We ask this in the name of your Son and for your glory alone. Amen. Amen.